That was the trash car and drag way into you. Hello. Hi. I never thought if I meant to look at we usually just do this audio, this is gonna be weird. Hello, welcome to Trash Crab Stevens, I'm your host, Benjamin Thomas Blair, aka Thomas Violence, aka the amazing Captain Thunderbolt, aka the Butterfly Man. Uh, with me today is our special guest. Correct me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Genghis Wengus. <laughs> Infamous lead singer of Genghis Wengus. My Chemical Romance. Now yeah. solo artist. Yes. Hello and welcome to Trash Crunch Stevens. Ah, dude, I'm, I'm psyched we, we could put this, pull this together. It seemed very unlikely and good, thank I you, know. by the way. Yeah, I felt no very problem. professional walking through all of these things, being like, hello, guest boss, hello, <laughs> guest boss. I'm a real person. Uh, first question off the bat. Yeah. Two part question. First part is a statement, second part question. You are very famous. Okay. Second part question. What's that like? Oh, oh, what's that like? Good, bad, mixed. It's mixed. It's mixed. I think it's like anything else. It's mixed. I think when you're when you're a kid and you have these dreams, you want to be famous. You're like, that's got to be the coolest thing ever. And then you get famous, and then you're just like, oh, this is fucking really hard. I can imagine. And especially yeah. like, obviously, it's a lot different for me now, like, because it's been years that I've had a career. But like, when we're at the height of stuff at Black Parade. I mean, there were situations where we're in vans in Mexico and we think it's going to get tipped over and lit on fire. Yeah. And James, yeah. has, James has been in those situations with me before. What did they do? In Mexico? With the van? Yeah, like, they're going to tip it over. But they're going to tip it over out of love, so it's okay. It's psycho psychopath. Well, That's terrifying. Um, yeah. So... At your level of fame, yeah. Can you go to the supermarket? Is that an option? Well, I live in LA, so going to the supermarket as a famous person in LA is is no big deal. It's par for the course. It's it's really sweet, actually. You still I still run into people, but mostly it's people that just kind of want to just be like, hey, I just want to say hi, you know. But a lot of people in LA are like know a friend of yours who knows a friend of yours. Yeah. LA is kind of like that, so you'll be in the supermarket and some dude will be like. Hey, what's up, man? I'm like, actually, we have a mutual friend, and then they mention a name, and usually you're like, I don't know who that is, but I'll go with this. Yeah, sure, yeah, of course. I'll keep rolling with this. Jim, I know Jim. Yeah, I love Jim, Jim. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, he's a great guy, seven foot tall. So that's an LA thing, but um, but it's you know, it's 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 pretty par for the course. You see, I think my friend saw Kiefer Sutherland ordering tacos once. Yeah. And he was like, just walk across the street ordering tacos, just keep for another one. God, that's so amazing. I've always yeah. assumed it would be like super prohibitive that you like, you reach a point and you're just like, well, <coughs> I'm not leaving the house. I'm never yeah. leaving the house again. When it was like the height of the fame for the band, like with Black Parade, we just couldn't go to malls. Yeah. <laughs> well, the demographic at malls is pretty singular, so yeah. that kind of makes sense. Couldn't go to malls. Yeah, that's your people. Yeah, yeah, that was our people, the mall people. <laughs> It's just the, the goths that are standing by the fountains. Yes. If you do a tale around those, yeah. you'll probably be fine. Exactly. Uh, my second question mm. is from a friend of mine who okay. asked, and this is probably the most important question I'm going to ask you. Okay. Who are you wearing? <laughs> okay. So, this is a t-shirt a fan gave me that is inside out mm -hmm. because I figured it's like getting a new shirt if you turn it inside out because I was wearing the other shirt. It's got like all the cereal people on it like uh, Count Chocula oh wow yep and I noticed a lot of pictures on the internet were like me with a fan wearing it and I was like they're gonna think I only own one shirt so let me turn it inside out that wouldn't be so bad though that no has a, a reputation to get chill guy that wears the same t-shirt every day yeah, just wears, you just That's find terrible. something on the road and you get comfortable with it you pack a bunch of clothes but you really only wear the same fucking thing every day no that makes sense we did a tour like uh, I don't know, it would have been a year ago, and I ended up wearing the same t-shirt and jeans for two weeks. Yeah. Which is disgusting. It's disgusting, but, but that's how it rolls. I was comfortable, it was freezing, so the yeah. idea of getting naked uh -huh. and then getting into different clothes was the least good thing I could think of. Me and of. my wife were exactly the same way, like, because, maybe it's because we picked it up from touring, but we literally <coughs> wear the same fucking shit. If you get away with you it. Know. Yeah. If I'm, like, unemployed or on holidays. What else am I wearing? I'm wearing a really old pair of chucks. Yep, um, I can support that. That's a good decision. I think these green, these green army pants are from J. Crew, and then this is my favorite jacket. This is I've worn this for now four years, and it got so fucked up that I had to get it repaired while I was oh out here. Oh my god, you've so, sewn el essentially elbow patches on. Yeah, the the pockets were all blown you've out. You've replaced a button there. There's a button. It's now a red button because I thought that would look decent, but the collar, <laughs> like it. I but I wear it every day. I wear it every day at home. It's like my 
I don't know. I guess when I'm working, I wear it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was reading a, a thing a while back about uh, Nick Cave talking about how, like, when he goes into his little home studio, yeah. he, like, puts on a suit. He goes in from 9 to 5, and that's, like, his whole thing. A lot of people can do that. I, I tried to do that on this record because the whole look was, like, me wearing a suit. So I was like, I'm going to wear it for everything. Press. I'm going I'm to get used to wearing it all day, but I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> get out a suit guy. Yeah, like, six months into the project, I was started showing up like this to interviews. And I think you've done a great job. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I kind of get that, though, like... I have, for when I'm like writing or doing whatever, I try really hard to sort of set the atmosphere and what I'm doing by like, I will put all the mood lighting down, I'll yeah. put on really specific music, yeah. I'll put on my riding shirt, which is a terrible shit flannel shirt. Right, right, home. right. But like getting in that mind space is kind of hard to get. Right, yeah. It it's harder to do when it involves a lot more work, like the suit's got to be clean, the suit's got to be pressed. Like <laughs> That's just, true. You know, you can't like go to work every day in a stinky ass suit. You gotta like... Unless the work is your home and that's the only true. person criticizing you would be your wife that's and very, daughter. Yeah, that's very true. Do you feel comfortable in a suit? Not really. Uh, I've, I've never mastered that. I have this thing where I need something to get on stage with. Like, I need to put some kind of costume on. Yeah. So that's why it works for me. Mm -hmm. I definitely could not get up there like this. Like, it would feel too weird. Yeah. Um, but I've always had a costume. I, I think, like, to some extent, every band does that. Like, I mean, we're shit not shit we're just we're a small band right. but and we dress more or less how we normally do except there are small minor changes we make you know we're going to play a show and then coincidentally we go on stage all of us are wearing our favorite band shirts or right. our nicest pair of jeans right you now even if you won't admit it there's still some slightly theatrical element to it like yeah I know bands that are just like shit grunge bands that are like there's still a little element of putting on an appearance that you think it's what you're doing. One of my favorite bands, we're playing a stadium the other night with the Foo Fighters, Rise Against. Yeah, yeah, that's and it. I, I, we, were gonna do, we did Astro Zombies together. So we had to practice it. I went back and I saw basically their wardrobe set up <laughs> and it was just black t-shirts, but it was different ones. It was like, oh, do I want to wear the DRI shirt? Yeah. <laughs> or do I want to wear this black flag one or it something? It says a lot. Like, those are strategic choices. Yeah, it's like, well, if I'm DRI, then that's kind of, well, that's kind of thrash, skate thrash today. I don't know. <laughs> But it's funny because they got all on stage, they're all wearing black, but it was which black am I yeah. wear? Those are important choices. You yeah. want to know, like, because it's kind of a strategic decision as well. If you're playing a stadium and you wore, like, some local, like, for instance, I'm doing that right now. I made a strategic decision to wear a Z-Horse t-shirt. There you go. Because I fucking love these guys. A lot of people I've seen make that decision too, like, uh, a smaller band or a friend's band or a very indie band, they'll wear it in a big venue. Yeah, and that's I think know, that's cool. It gets, it's a cool thing to do. You know, a lot of people take pictures when you're playing a stadium. So, I think that was the logic behind going and covering Astro Zombies. Is basically Tim from Rise was like, "We're gonna play Astro Zombies by the Misfits in a stadium full of people," and I don't know if that's ever been done before. Yeah, it's so. <laughs> actually really great. Yeah. That seems punk as hell. You're like, "Fuck you! Punk, you will yeah. enjoy this." this and is they had a music group, plenty of great set. Like all the songs were like hits. They were all killer. And they decided, ah, we're going to play this song that people don't know. And they had the crowd by the balls at that point. Like, yeah. everybody was loving them. Eddie Vedder does that a lot as well. Like, Pearl Jam will just throw in these, like, crazy-ass covers where you're like, where the fuck is this coming right, from? Right, and then right. these people that are like, I mean, they're essentially listening to Dad Rock. And if they're a real Pearl Jam fan, they've been doing it for 25 years. Right, right. That are listening to these artists that would never otherwise get exposure. Right. Which is yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to consult my notes again. All right, go to your notes. I have more. Actually, no, I know the next one off my heart. Mordheim. Mordheim. Ah, oh, man, the moment you mentioned that, I was just like, what so, the fuck? Yeah, so not only you, but there's some uh, somebody else, too, that's, like, in our circle that collects that shit. It's, like... But you you really go deep. You're as deep as me, basically. I fucking love that game. You I know, played the shit out of it. Yeah, I, I, my brother, for Christmas, he got me Necromunda box. <laughs> Holy shit. Sealed, yeah. Where from? eBay. You know, Fuck. I have a Warhammer Quest I got sealed. Like, we've been collecting this shit forever, and um, I'm trying. I want to get a game of Mordheim going with oh, my friends. Man, if they ever set up like a good tabletop way to play Mordheim, we're doing that because that'll be I would love amazing. That. No one wants to play that game, and because the rules aren't like they're not supported. It's just like right. that PDF you can download from the Games Workshop site. Right. And you have to buy the regular Warhammer minis to get the Mordheim sets. Yeah. No one wants to play it. They make it a little difficult to play, so... And the rules are kind of unbalanced and ridiculous, but it's so much fun. Yeah, it's just fun. And you get so invested in it. Your characters kind of build this little, like, story arc. Yeah, and they get, like, you can have a guy that dies, gets hurt, gets maimed. 
like gets cursed, has bad shit happen, and there's and they kept coming out with stuff too, like different charts and like, yeah. no, not, this, you know, this is what happens between the adventure. And you're like, all right, that was so good. You got so much more involved in it. Like the the Warhammer ones, you know, it's cool. Like you start again, it's the same thing every time. But being right. like, oh no, I lost that guy. I've had him since I started playing like right. two years ago. It was right, cool. right. The Inquisitor was another one I really wanted to get into. I couldn't, I couldn't. I had already had so many minis from Warhammer that I couldn't go up a scale. Yeah, 40 mil is, is too like, much. Inquisitor would have been fucking amazing if if it was small scale yeah. and like you could use all the shit you already had. You know. But I mean? having to specifically invest in minis, that were, and they were pretty expensive too. Yeah, they were really expensive. And getting parts to mix and match was nowhere near as easy. So if you wanted to be like, my guy only has this type of gun, you're like, well, I'm fucked. Yeah, exactly. That miniature doesn't exist. That should have been, I've always felt that should have been a full plastic set. Yeah. With multiple different configurations. Because you could parts. have covered so much stuff. If you've been like, here's a box with 24 characters, mm -hmm. you now have like, that's eight different people playing essentially. Mm -hmm. Could have been great. Also, the added complexity of having to have like a dungeon master there right. as well, man, right. it's not you quite a casual that. game. And then the worst, the hardest part is like the, the scenery. Yeah. So now you have all these miniatures that are this big, so now the scenery's got to yeah. get bigger, and you, you can't use any of the shit you have. I like the universe a bit more, though. They did some cool stuff with it. Yeah, I read like. some of the Eisenhorn books. Yeah, they were good. Those are good. Good in a way, actually. I read a bunch of those, like the 40K universe books, and the universe is cool, and what happens is cool, but the writers are generally just, like, hammy. Well, Dan Abnett, he's the guy that did Eisenhorn. Yeah. He he writes like comics too. He's I guess maybe the most well known of all those guys that yeah. writes those things. He did a lot of the Space Marine ones and stuff as well. He did yeah, yeah, he did a bunch of those. So he he's on like a kind of a kind of a bigger level than a lot of those guys. I know he I know he was writing X Men at some point. Oh really? For Marvel, yeah. So Do you he, know which arc that was? I don't know. No, but I know he was writing comics. Yeah. Shit, that's cool. So you also write comics. I do. Which is fucking amazing. Yeah. Uh, Award winning, mm -hmm. I believe, which is incredible. Yes. Do you do that a lot? I, I do it as much as I can. Yeah. Right now I'm writing series three of the Umbrella Academy, which is actually on schedule. Yeah. Um, and it's really going to happen this time because Gabrielle is going to start drawing in April. So yeah. basically I got to be ready by you, April. You're locked in. Yeah. yeah, I'm locked in. So, And I've made a like tremendous amount of progress i'm only about a week behind right now so that's pretty cool that's yeah a yeah amount of time yeah so i gotta you know in between projects is when i try to do that stuff or on the road is actually a great time to write but only if you can build a schedule that makes sense yeah like if if you're doing your own tour and you're like oh i have a hotel and then my lobby call is at i don't know let's say two o'clock every day that gives you all the time yeah but on a tour like this it's a little trickier because our lobby calls change. Some days we're flying. And so you don't you, want to start something if someone's going to like be randomly yelling at you through a radio you to can't, do something. Yeah, yeah, you get in a groove and you want to stay in it. Yeah. And, and I used to, man, it was, it, when I was writing the first Umbrella Academy, I was literally writing that backstage in arenas. Yeah. While shit was just constantly going on. I used to have big headphones on just so I could write this comic. Maybe that's like your creative environment. That's yeah. what you need. Yeah, you need I to be did. backstage at a stadium. Yeah. Lots of noise. If you're not like working on a specific project that you know is going to get picked up, do you still do like are you drawing, are you writing stuff? Are you yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll work on stuff constantly that I don't know will ever see the light of day. Like, yeah, I'm always developing new ideas, and I'm just not yeah, I'm just not always sure what if I'm ever going to have the time to do it or if it's going to get picked up or yeah. whatever. But I have to keep trying new ideas. Um, that's the way I make Umbrella Academy exciting for myself because if it was the same thing every every story, I'd have a really hard time sticking with it. Yeah. So the book has changed dramatically from graphic novel to graphic novel, and the third graphic novel is very different. Yeah. yeah. So you've gotten a lot of critical recognition in terms of like the music and the comics, and obviously a lot of popular recognition as well. Do you get to a point where, I mean, it kind of forces you to have an internal value system, right? Like, if you produce something and you put it online right now there is a pretty good chance i would say a 95 percent chance you'll get an overwhelming wave of positive feedback like yeah it's true you kind of have to get to a point where you're like i know this is good i'm doing it because it makes me feel good to do it like yes that's exactly where you have to get you 
you basically you, you kind of don't think about the audience like you know you think about fans in terms of if like 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 a question I constantly get about Umbrella Academy is when are we going to find out more about the horror or when are we going to find out more about yeah. the horror and so you hear that enough and you're like alright well I'll, I'll start that because st- I have that storyline in my head let me start it maybe a little earlier because it's something people want but otherwise you're making it because it doesn't exist it's something you want to see and it's something you want to do yeah. if it gets positive feedback cool if it gets negative feedback cool because you just wanted to do it yeah you know that's always my drive for making something like yeah especially with writing it's always like i have a, an image or there'll be a sentence or something in my head where i'll be like i want this to exist it right. doesn't exist but you can paint that picture or you can do whatever and you can make it real mm-hmm. and then it's out of your system right you've made that thing real i think that's what like essentially creativity is is some form of exorcism of an idea from the yeah. body yeah i agree it's a cool agree. concept uh, the next thing on my list yeah. is Bakun. Oh my god. Let's talk about it. Oliver Leach, photographer, Twitter extraordinaire. Yeah, I love Bakun. That guy. He's got Twitter figured out in a way that a lot of people don't. Four minutes? All right. We have four minutes. All right. Yeah, he is, he is uh, something else. How did I end up even yeah, how, how finding... How did you find this group of people online? <laughs> don't remember if it was Andy Richter that retweeted him. <laughs> he was definitely he is a weird gateway into yeah quote unquote weird Twitter. Because I was following Andy Richter and I think Andy Richter retweeted him and I was like who's Bakun? And then like I, I opened his feet up and I'm like this is the strangest cat I've ever seen. Like, it's but uh, it's he's so hard to describe because it's not even like it's overtly strange. It's right. not like something where you look at a picture and given no context you're like right. that's bizarre it's right. things that are slightly offbeat right that he will give a caption where you're like this is from another universe yeah 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 he's found something that exists he, ha- he has a way of looking at things i think he's like this kind of artist because you look at his actual art that he makes his too. photography is amazing yeah it's amazing and there's some of these really strange decisions that yeah. he's made um so I think he's got a perception of the world that's really interesting. Like, what did he direct message me the other day? Just a picture of the throne from Dune with Raban's head there. And he's like, dude, the fucking throne. And it was out of nowhere. We haven't DM'd each other in, like, months. And <laughs> I don't know. He's got a really interesting way of looking at things. I like, I like that he actually... He was the only person in my book that got a pass when tweeting about Gamergate. Yeah. He kept it going so long that it actually became funny again. Yeah, he was pretty good. And he wasn't doing it in like a... I don't know, the way that he was coming at it was good. He was brutal, but just wasn't whiny about it. I don't know. It was yeah, amazing. yeah, it was weird because when the Gamergate thing happened, it was just like, oh, people, I don't even want to... It's exhausting. It was exhausting, it was to, exhausting, look exhausting to look at Twitter. It was exhausting to look at Twitter. And it's like, if you... They seem to think if you don't pay attention to it, it's just going to get bigger. Me, I seem to think if you don't pay attention to it, nothing's going to fucking happen. No. And that eventually won out. Like, eventually people oh, yeah. stopped paying attention to it. Because it was a it. dumb movement that wasn't going to yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. It was eventually going to lose impetus, and it did. Now who gives a shit? Yeah, like, and it's like, people say, well, people are still talking about it. I'm like, yeah, the same fucking people that are talking about it yeah. that they were since the beginning. Like, But... Bakun's take on it was so relentlessly every day in the most brutal way like do like 10 posts in a row yeah. with Gamergate hashtags of like a dude in like bondage latex sitting on a toilet playing a GameCube yeah just like he was fucking relentless uh, and, one of them I remember was just like it was like three people sitting on a couch wearing full latex I think just yeah. sitting like perfectly still hashtag Gamergate yeah, that's all yeah. they do <laughs> Oh, he just I, I really want to know what his process is yeah he's, he's got to like because you sit down at Google Images and right. he's like a bunch of dogs that look like they've just discovered religion right. Or like, right, right I remember that that picture how do you find three pictures of like Alsatians or whatever they are staring into I don't space know. oh we gotta talk about the dress the dress oh okay. my god okay so if first that off that fucking dress is blue and black yeah of course it's and blue and black anybody that's saying that you're crazy you saying it's, it's white and gold yeah. oh. absolute bullshit I'm and not that his friend is anymore. Why, that is actually why we have war and conflict. Because you can boil it down to that dress. The fact that a dress is fucking blue and black. It's factually blue and black. It's factually In real blue life. and black. Yeah. And people are saying it's white and gold is the fact that there's conflict yeah. in the world. It's it's that just, means there's something 
fucking wrong <laughs> with something in people's brains from a sp- like a certain that fucking dress is black and blue. Like we could know for a fact that it's one thing, and then like apropos of nothing, right? You can have two people sitting at the same computer looking at the same image, see right. it so differently, right. and have it be so divisive is insane. It's, it's, why are it we doing the thing? Why do we have civilization when that can occur? Right, that makes me think that too. It's like why do we have even structure? How did we ever build a building or, f- or how figure out a how car to make a telephone? Get on the road yeah. and obey road rules right. when we can't decide on the color of a dress. Okay, Santa that is very obviously black and it's a black blue. Oh, I was almost yelling at people at work. Yeah. Uh, it's so weird because there are people that are like, this is probably a great test of people. The people that look at it, see that people feel differently and go, right. oh, hey, that's cute. Scientifically, we see things differently. Right. Then this one fucking piece of shit that I work with right. was just like, no, it is white and gold. You're a fucking idiot. I'm going to try and persuade you that it's white and gold. And the whole and I'm like, scientifically, we see things differently. How do you mean that? Because it's very clearly black and blue. Like... How can you see everything else the same? I guess so. It's white balance that was specific to that picture. I mean, if you're colorblind, picture. you'll see it differently. Yeah, we asked a colorblind guy at work, and that's what did he mean. Say? Uh, he said he saw blue and gray, so he was still okay, on our side. Okay, so he, he's still, but, it, but ma- mainly he was right. Are we done? All right. All right. Uh, last question then. Okay. How are you? I'm really good. That's great. <laughs> it is nice to finally meet you. Yeah, dude. And connect. It's, it's been a big build up. One cool thing about tours, um, I got to meet a. Uh, a uh, few people now. I got to meet DVS and Rachel. Oh, and fuck it. You met Rachel and I believe my friend Annabelle was there as yes, well. Yes, yes, yes. In New York. She's like, because she used to live in Brisbane. She's okay. like one of my best friends in the world. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. So Rachel that's cool. Like, I get to tour and like every once in a while I'll meet a Twitter friend and it's super nice. So crazy. Yeah. I just, I love the juxtaposition of like, you're the MCR guy. You're, right. and then here you are in this Twitter world and then after a while it just naturalizes it, yeah. it stops being like a celebrity identity thing it's just like oh yeah that was the only way I could survive using it was just to be natural and really be myself I couldn't I couldn't use it as like a celebrity uses it I, 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 <laughs> I find that to be pretty exhausting watching people do that I think Cher is probably the only person who uses Twitter correctly she's pretty next level yeah I don't know I just want to talk to her. I really yeah. want to talk to her in real life because the disconnect between her as she is in movies and music and then what she is online is yeah. insane. It's insane. Well, thank you so much for doing this. No it was worries. super lovely to meet you. You uh, too. Tui was here as well. He was filming. Thanks, hey. Tui. Hey. Tui, just point it towards your face before you stop. Oh, okay. Just point it towards... No, just okay. point it at your mug. Point it at just your tattoos. Just just, no, just video your tattoos. Can you just quickly video... Just, just your leg tattoos. Just video your leg tattoos real quick. <laughs> just... Just on your knees. Just the top of your knees. Just James Dimmick. Thanks very much. Trash grab. Peace out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, dude. That was great. Oh, it's the trash car. Drag way into you.